Welcome. Let me invite you to come on in and find your seat. We're so glad that you can uh, be with us this morning. If you're a guest this morning, let me just uh, especially um, welcome you. We're so glad you've chosen to be with us. And um, how many of you are glad this morning to be in the house of the Lord? Yes, we're so glad. Yes, it's been a long time, but we're glad that you're here. And listen, today is a very special day, okay? First of all, uh, today is David and Carol Loftus's first Sunday. And so I want to take just a moment to introduce uh, David and Carol to you. And normally, um, outside of a pandemic, we would have a big reception and welcome them. But let's let them know how much we are looking forward to getting to know them. Let's welcome them with a warm, yes. Today's their very first Sunday, and so we're excited. I want you to know to be praying for them because they got to sell a house in Greensboro and then uh, make that transition here, so they're still commuting right now. But just excited, David, about you and Carol being with us. And so let's begin our time of worship this morning with a time of prayer. Would you join me with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and for your faithfulness in our lives. Father, that we can trust your love and care in every moment and every season of our life. We thank you for new beginnings and new seasons. We thank you for David and Carol for how you've worked in their lives in the past. And now, Lord, we just lift them to you as they make their transition here as our new worship and groups pastor. I pray, Lord, that you just give them wisdom. Father, that you provide just a smooth transition. And Lord, as we begin our journey together this morning, I just pray that you would just, just pour out your presence amongst us as we worship you this morning. We love you, Lord, and we commit now this time to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Well, good morning, church. It is so good to be with you today. Whether you are here in front of us or in front of a screen at home, it is a delight to be able to share in the ministry of the word together as we sing to one another and as we listen to the word and as we have opportunity to respond to it. These are unusual days and you're hearing all kinds of things on the news about whether you should be here or not, whether you should sing in church or not. <laughs> and I just want to go ahead and tell you, we believe that the church of God is built on people who choose to love him and to worship him and connect heart to heart with him. So I want to encourage you in two or three different ways. If you're a big singer, you really do have a lot of aerosols that come out. If you need to, sit a row behind other people so that you've got a little extra room or keep that mask on when you're singing so you can really give it heart and soul to the Lord. If you're scared about that, keep your mask on and you sing under that mask. But whatever you do, sing to the Lord because he has triumphed gloriously and he is with us today. And he is for us today. And so we praise him as we share together. Would you stand and let's sing together about our powerful God. Our God. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Sing that chorus again. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Oh, what could stand? Our God, 
together. Amen. Amen. Come on. He is a mighty God. Amen. He is the great king over all the earth. And one of the powerful things he has done for us is he's given us an opportunity to join his family by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that work has given us the opportunity to join his family. And we're going to begin a study today with the pastor in 2 Thessalonians. And as we go into that study, we're going to spend our first Sunday talking about the believers and the incredible joy we have to share together. So I'm going to ask you that you look at this memory verse with us that's going to be our theme verse for the book of 2 Thessalonians. It's 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. And up on the screen it says this, We ought also always. always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your, your faith, faith is, is growing, growing more, more and, and more, more, and the, the love, love every one of you has for each other is increasing. increasing. Let's take a shot at reading that together, and then I want you to work on memorizing it throughout this week, okay? Let's share it together. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. 3. We, we ought, ought to always to thank God, God for you, brothers, brothers and, and rightly so, for your, your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. increasing. Isn't that a great thought? What would we do without each other in the body? To have Jesus should be enough, but the reality is we got to grow together. And we need each other in these times. Just like Job said, in the hardest times, you are the one who is with us. You are the one who encourages us. You are the one God who speaks to us. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say. Lord, blessed be your name. Sing this with us, would you? It's okay if you want to clap your hands. Matt, lead us, would you? Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Where streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out. Oh 
your name this morning as we sing together the God who gives and takes away, the God who showers us with blessing and takes us through the storms. We trust you and we lean on you and we ask for your help this morning as we share together in this hour, and as your word bathes us with its truth and its power and its encouragement. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like you to watch this short video before Pastor Ed comes to speak to us today. Congregation, we live in an upside-down world. Amen? Billy Graham said it like this, and I quote, We live in an upside-down world. Listen carefully. He says, People hate when they should love. Have you seen any of that this week? People quarrel when they should be friendly, he says. Fight when they should be peaceful. Wound when they should heal. Steal when they should share. Do wrong when they should do right. Now John Piper describes life in this world like this. He says life is like a raging river of fallen humanity. Now when you think about that, life is like a raging river of fallen humanity. How many of you this week have felt the strong currents of our society rushing away from God and His ways. How many of you felt that? You just, you just feel it every moment, every day almost. It's like the floodgates have been opened in our culture and the forces of evil are sweeping away everything in its path. I, I want to suggest to you this morning that our current circumstances as depicted in this video demonstrate that at every level of society things literally have been turned upside down. I want to suggest to you this morning that the tragic results of sin, which include, by the way, actions and inactions, are apparent at every level of our lives. You, you see, sin and the rejection of God, all right, is showing itself in each and every one of our lives on a personal level. It's showing itself in the family as families all across our land are struggling, are dysfunctional in so many ways. 
It's showing itself in, listen, in the evangelical church. Did you realize the evangelical church is actually declining in our country more this past year than recent years? Yeah, sin and the rejection of God's will and ways, it's showing itself in every level, including society, as we see chaos in every way. So the question this morning is, how do we live upright in an upside-down world? How do we as followers of Jesus Christ live in this upside-down world? Well, congregation, I've got good news for you this morning. God gives us some clear guidance on this through Paul's second letter to the church at Thessalonica. And I want to invite you, take your copy of God's Word and turn there with me or click there with me and find your place at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now, the Thessalonian believers stand really as a model church for all other churches. They are in many ways a picture of what a church should be and what a church should do when it is facing troubled times. Now, you need to know that this letter really only has three short chapters, and they are all full of wisdom and encouragement for us as God's church to stay the course as we go through uncertain and even troubled times. Now, the context of 2 Thessalonians is very important. First of all, you need to know that the Thessalonian church was born in great difficulties. You can read the story in the book of Acts chapter 17. In fact, we learn in chapter 17 of Acts that Paul spent three weeks in this town proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. We learn in those three weeks, how would you like to start a a church in three sermons? (laughs) That's that's what Paul did. He he preached three sermons in this this town and a church was born. Many people, Jews, Jews and Greeks came to faith in Christ through the preaching of the great apostle Paul. But here's what I want you to know. As soon as the church was established, the new believers had trouble. They conquered opposition in so many ways. In fact, the Bible says that some bad characters rounded up a mob. There were riots all in the city. There was violence. There, many of them were, were jailed. In fact, Paul had to leave the city during the night knowing that he would never be able to return. Now think about it for a moment. Imagine you being a church planner, having three weeks with a new group of believers, trying to get them established, trying to get them going, and then all of a sudden, because of opposition, because of mobs and riots, and because of his own safety, you having to flee that town, knowing that you probably would never, ever come back again. You see, Paul had to leave the city. And so a few months later... Somewhere around 51, 52 A.D., a few months later, he wrote his first letter back to the church of Thessalonica. And then a short time after that, he wrote the letter that we're going to be studying together, 2 Thessalonians. And here's why he wrote. He primarily wrote this letter to assure those early believers that God was indeed at work in this upside-down world. He wrote this to encourage them to stand strong. Now today, we're only going to look at four verses. That's all we're going to look at. And I want to quickly just give you the main idea, and then I'm going to share four simple truths that kind of support that main idea that come right from these first four verses. Here's the main idea. The main idea this morning is this. God is working in us. Now, some of us this morning need to hear that. We may be watching the news all the time, and we may be concluding that, what, God's not doing anything. I'm telling you, God is at work in our world. He's not only at work in our world, He's at work in us as we encounter trials and troubles. And what is He doing in our lives? He is purifying us by teaching us to stand fast in a corruptible and dying world. Now I want you to look closely at that because these are comforting words. These are encouraging words. In a world that has been turned upside down, here's what we know. God is on the throne. God is at work and he's not just working around us, he's working in us. And what is he wanting to do? He's wanting to purify us. He's wanting to refine us. And as he does that, he's teaching us and encouraging us to stand fast in a corruptible and dying world. Now, let me just share with you four simple truths that support this main idea, and they all flow right from the text, verses 1 through 4. Here's the first thing I want you to note this morning. 
first, as we face an upside-down world, here's what we need to know. We have a firm foundation in God and Jesus Christ. Look with me at verse 1. Paul identifies himself as the author along with Silas and Timothy. He says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church. This is just simply the greeting. To the church of the Thessalonians. Notice the word in. In God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then verse 2. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now congregation, I want you to circle a couple of words there. I want you to circle the word church. Because here's what Paul is doing. Paul is not just saying, hello, my name is Paul. No, Paul is speaking some significant things here in these introductory words. He's speaking to the church in Thessalonica. In in some ways, listen, look what he says. Circle the word of, of the Thessalonians, and then the word in. Circle that word in. Here's what the Apostle Paul is saying. In his greeting, he is laying out a very significant truth that we must always keep in the forefront of our minds. And here's what it is. He is simply reminding them that they belong to God the Father. Now, isn't that comforting to know that in a world that is falling all apart, who do we belong to, church? We belong to to God. In fact, notice what he says. He says, to the church of the Thessalonians. Where, Where was this church at? It was in Thessalonica. That would be northern Greece today, right? And so in in an essence, we live in two worlds. We are of Eastern Wake County, right? We are the church of God in Christ here in Wendell area in uh, Eastern Wake County. But notice not, we're not just of Eastern Wake County. We're in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what in the world does Paul mean when he says we are in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's kind of a very unique greeting here. Let me mention a couple things. It means that we're in God's family. How comforting is it for you to know that we're in God's family? We're in God's family. We're under His love. We're under His care. We're under His protection. And listen, not only are we in God's family... But we're also servants of Christ. In other words, yes, we live in troubled times, but guess what? We're under, we're not under our president's leadership. We're not under any civil politician leadership. We're under the leadership of Jesus Christ. We're servants of Christ. Now, I want you to write down just two words, family and servants. Paul is simply saying, yes, I know you're living in a chaotic world, but remember, you're, you're in God's family. You belong to God the Father. That simply means, okay, we are under His protective hand. We're under His loving care. And then He not only says we're in the Father, but we're also in the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning we're under His charge. We're under His leadership. Here's another way of saying it. We belong to Christ no matter what happens in our world. We are of this world, but we're in who? We're in God the Father. We're in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is incredible. The church is still the church, even though we live in uncertain and chaotic times. That's a comforting thought for me. In fact, this pandemic does not change the fact of who we are. Church, listen to me. We are in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. We belong to Him. We live under His hand. We live under His protection. We live under His care. And by the way, that's very comforting to me. And that's exactly what Paul's trying to do. He's like, look, look, some of the people have been put in jail. <laughs> and, and, and Paul was writing them, look, you, you, yes, you're of Thessalonica, you're, you're a part of all that mess that's going on, the riots, the mobs, and, and some of you have been arrested, but remember who you belong to. You belong to God. Congregation, this is why it's so important, listen, that we set our mind's attention and our heart's affection on the care of our God and our Father during this time. How many of you know that you can set your mind on the uncertainty of this day and go crazy? Here's what Paul is saying. Before he even gets into the real meat, he's saying, listen, you remember who you are. You have a firm foundation in him, and therefore set your mind on that firm foundation, on God's attention and care and leadership 
in your life. So Paul greets the church in such a way as to remind them that they are a family. Let's say it together. We are God's family. Let's say it together. We are God's family. Just think about that. He's not going to let us go. Right? He, he's in control. And, and even though he may ec be exercising judgment in our world, and even though that judgment might be bringing suffering in our life, here's what I'm telling you. God is caring for his family even in this. Because God cares more about your holiness than he does your health. John Piper says, okay, if God had a dollar, he'd give 99 cents for your holiness and one cent for your health. Now imagine if we felt the same way. Imagine if we felt like holiness was more important than our health. You say, well, why is, why is all this going on? I, I believe God is exercising judgment. I do believe that in His judgment, we also, as His people, are suffering. But I also believe it is righteous and it is just judgment because God is purifying us. God is working in us to make us more like Himself even as he judges an unbelieving world. John Piper reminds us also that in these terms, I love the way John Piper says this, he says that in these two descriptions of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Piper goes on to say that, that he's actually meeting our two deepest needs in life. Do you realize how desperately we need to be rescued? Do you realize how desperately... Not only do we need to be rescued, but we need our Father's help. And we need purpose and meaning in life. Piper says that we need a Heavenly Father who sympathizes with us so much that He rescues us from our sin and misery. How many of you know God in Christ has rescued us? He has. And not only that, we also need a Heavenly Lord to guide us in life and tell us what is wise and give us great meaning and purpose in life. Look at verse 2. I love verse 2. It says, grace and peace. By the way, our two greatest needs in life. There's nothing more you need in life than grace and peace. I sure would love for my heart to beat in rhythm all the time, but it doesn't. But my greatest need is not for my heart to beat in rhythm. My greatest need is for grace and peace to flow from my God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ into my life. And, and Paul is just reminding them, hey, listen, this is who you are. Your foundation is in a God who first and foremost does what? Pours out His grace in your life. The congregation, there are three types of grace that we have to have in life. Saving grace. How many of you know we need God's saving grace? We're sinners and we can't save ourselves. But we need more than just saving grace. We need sustaining grace. We need grace to be able to live in this world that's turned upside down. We need grace to live by. And then we also need equipping grace, right? We need, to be, we need grace in our lives just to be able to serve and do the things that God has called us to do. But notice... Not only is there grace flowing from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in our relationship with Him, but there's peace. How many of you need peace? Well, there are three types of peace we need too. We need spiritual peace. How many of you are glad this morning that Jesus has made peace with God on our behalf? Right, Jesus has settled the score between, uh, between us and Him because we've trusted Him as our Savior. So in Christ, we've been given spiritual peace, right? We're no longer enemies of God in our sin, but our sin has been paid for. But there's a second type of peace that we all need. We need emotional peace. How many of you struggle sometimes with having peace of mind, right, in these crazy days. So he's saying, listen, in your relationship with God, in your foundation relationship with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, not only does grace flow in all those ways, but peace flows in those ways. And we need emotional peace. But then thirdly, we need what kind of peace? Relational peace. I mean, we looked at the television this week, and what, what have we noticed? The world is starving for relational peace. Why? Because the world does not have God the Father and Jesus Christ as their foundation. But Paul says in his greeting, listen, this is not just like, hello, my name is Ed, hope you're doing fine. No, Paul is saying, know who you are. 
Know where you are. Yes, you are of Thessalonica, but you are in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that relationship flows all the grace that you're going to need and all the peace that you're going to need to do what? To live upright in an upside down world. That's what he's saying. Powerful words. And so we have a father whose care and protection in troubled times can be fully trusted. Anybody say amen to that? We have a father, a good father, <laughs> whose care and love and protection in troubled times can be fully trusted. And not only that, we have the Lord Jesus Christ whose leadership can always be trusted in hostile times. Isn't that awesome? That even in the midst of hostile times, in the midst of, of difficult times, we have a commander who can be fully trusted. And notice everything flows from God's grace. The second thing I want you to see from this text, though, is Paul, Paul really starts commending them. We are to have a growing faith. So first of all, you, we need to know our foundation is firm in God, the Father, and Jesus Christ. Secondly, I want you to notice we are to have a growing faith. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, we ought to always to thank God for you. Paul is saying, you know what? I'm bragging about you, Thessalonica. By the way, Thessalonica was a young church. You don't have to be an old church to be a strong church. This was a young church. This was an inexperienced church. But Paul's saying, listen, you know what? I, I'm, I'm actually bragging about you. Look what he says. I, I'm giving thanks to God for you, brothers, and rightly so. Notice what he says. Because your faith is what? Growing more and more. How do we live in troubled times? Our faith in God should be doing what? Growing more and more. Now, congregation, faith is the vertical response to God's grace. The word faith just simply means this. It's not learning more of the Bible. It's trusting more in the God of the Bible. Right? You, 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 can, you cannot grow in faith and yet grow in knowledge. <laughs> but growing in faith is learning to trust Him more and more. It's growing in your confidence in God's love, in God's care, in God's purpose, in God's timing for your life. And so think about it for just a moment. What does it mean for us to have a growing faith? It simply means that we trust Jesus more today than we did when? Yesterday. Now think about what we're trusting the Lord for. We're trusting Him to take care of our past life. How many of you have sins and transgressions in your past? Yeah, we all do, don't we? What are we doing? We're trusting that in Jesus Christ, what? God has forgiven us of all of our what? We don't have to live in the past because Christ is taking care of our past sins and transgressions. How many of you are trusting God for forgiveness of your sins? So that's part of growing in our faith. But not only are we trusting Him in our past life, how many of you know that a growing faith requires us to trusting more and more in our present life? What do we trust the Lord to do in our present life? To provide for our needs. To provide the necessities. To provide protection and deliverance and the guidance that we need, the wisdom that we need in life. And so Paul is just saying, hey, you guys are doing it right because guess what you're doing? You're growing in your confidence to God, in God, to meet your needs even though you're being locked up and put in jail. Even though you're being persecuted, even though you're facing serious times, you're growing in your faith because you're trusting Him to meet your needs in troubled times. And by the way, do we not need to grow in our faith for God to take care of our future life as well? How many of you have, are trusting God to deliver you from the judgment? <laughs> right? I am trusting Him to do that. And so a growing faith in Jesus Christ simply means that you and I are learning to trust Him. We're learning to rely on Him. We're learning to depend on Him more and more. Now, can I just tell you something? Growth is not instant. Spiritual growth is not instant, right? I would love to be able to say it is, but it's just not. It's progress. It takes time. 
And what Paul is commending them for here is that they are growing in their dependence on God to provide all of their daily necessities. They are growing in dependent on God to deliver them through all their trials and temptations, to comfort them through the losses of life. How many of you know that in life there are losses? And we have to even trust God, okay, to comfort us through our losses. And that's exactly what he's talking about. We're growing in him to teach us the truth, to guide us forward, to strengthen us in our walk with God. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, how can we grow in our faith? Let me just give you a couple of things real quick. First of all, we can grow in our faith by knowing God better through his word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the what? The word of God. Look, look, we're not going to get stronger in our faith if we're ignorant of His Word. Because what is our faith in? Our faith is in God's Word, in God and His Word. So the more you know Him, His love, His power, His plan, His concern, the more faith you're going to be able to trust and demonstrate in your life. But then here's the second way that we can grow in our faith, by exercising faith. Now, how do you get strong in the gym? I know some of you are about to die to get back to the gym, right? Maybe so, soon. But how do we get stronger? By exercising our what? Our muscles. And so how does our faith get stronger? The more we trust God, the more we trust His Word, the more our confidence in God grows. How many of you in the past have had to really trust God in a certain time, and what did God prove to be? He proved to be faithful. Right? You know, I was thinking this week about 1992. Christian and I had just got married. We had just bought a home. We both had great jobs. And we were taking experience in God. And God began to speak and call us out of, that men, uh, out of uh, the work world into vocational ministry. And I reflected on that this week for a bit. It required us to make major adjustments. Uh, I resigned my job. We sold our house. We found a rental house. We, I went back to school, and, and I just went back, to, went back through and, and was looking and reading some of the things I had written during that time, and I'm like, wow, you know what? <laughs> I trusted him in 1992, and guess what he did? He provided. What in the world am I worried about today? <laughs> How many of you sometimes, you know, you're, you're faced this situation, your faith isn't strong like it needs to be, but, but just go back and remember How God did what? How he comforted you in your loss in 1996 or 2000 or whatever. How he was guiding you in the midst of a difficult time in your life or in your family. So congregation, we grow in our faith by exercising faith. Very important. And then listen, I love this one. We grow in our faith by fellowshipping with other believers. What's the best atmosphere for you to exercise faith? It certainly isn't in isolation. The best atmosphere for us to be strong and to be spurred on to to trust God and and, and to rely on God and depend on God is what? It's it's when we're together. In fact, many of you probably remember when you were younger, you went to youth group, you went to youth camp, and at youth camp, guess what? It was always easier to live the Christian life, to exercise faith when we were always together. It was always easier. This is one of the reasons why we should not forsake the coming together, the assembly of the gathering. We need each other. Look, it is in atmospheres like this. It is in atmospheres like our small group where, guess what? We can do what? We can grow in our faith. Very, very important. Congregation, the Christian life is not instant perfection. It requires some progress and advancement. And so Paul is saying, listen. Remember who you are. You're in God the Father, in Jesus Christ. You're under His care. You're in His family. You're under His leadership. Even though the world's falling apart. And notice he's saying, then secondly, in the midst of that, you need to be what? Growing in your faith. And then thirdly, look look at the last part of that verse. He says, not only is your faith growing more and more, but he says, and the love every one of you has for each other is what? It is increasing. Now, church, listen to me. Faith is our vertical response to God's grace. Love is our horizontal response to God's grace. Get that? That's very important. And faith in love is the essence of the Christian life. 
And Paul is just simply saying, look, you know what you're doing? The two things that really make up the Christian life, faith and love, you are doing what? You are improving, you are advancing, you are progressing. So if faith is our vertical response to God, that means we're growing in our faith, then love for one another is our horizontal response to God's grace. And so congregation, think about it for a moment. Troubled times call for loving action. The image here in this text is that our love is bubbling over like a river that's busting out of its bank. How many of you ever seen a, a, a river just, just busting out of its bank? It's just like overflowing. I mean, the boundaries of that river, I mean, it just... The idea here is that exceptional times require exceptional love from God's people. Paul's saying... You guys are young Christians. You're, you're a new church. But my goodness, you're doing a great job. You, you, you literally understand who you are in, in the Father, in, in, the, in Christ. You've got this firm foundation. You're growing in your faith. But guess what you're doing? You're loving each other more and more. Now, let me ask you this morning. What does our world most need right now? Love. And the greatest act of love is forgiveness. Not revenge. Right? The greatest act of love is forgiveness. I mean, can you, can you, can you just see Jesus on the cross when, 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 when he looks down and he says what? Father, what? Forgive them for they know not what they are doing. What does it mean to overflow with love for one another. It means that like a river overflowing its banks, we're just looking for someone different from us to love on. In fact, let me just challenge you. Think about someone this week that's different from you and think about how you can show love to them. I'm not asking you to love people that are like you. I'm not asking you to love, just love people that, that, uh, that have the same political views you have or maybe the same skin color you have. Think about who is different around me and how can I do what? Show them love. Paul commends them here. He says, your love is increasing more and more. Your love is growing. And then notice verse 4. Verse 4 is beautiful. Verse 4 says, Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance. In other words, we're telling your story to all the other churches we're going to. And your story is an incredible story because it's about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. In other words, we've got to endure life's trials and troubles even though we tire out from the battle. You think this young church got tired of persecution? You think this young church got tired of its streets being filled with mobs and riots? I believe so. And Paul says, you know what? We understand what's going on in the city. It's crazy. Everything's out of whack. But we're bragging about you because in all of that, you're learning to trust God more. In all of that, you're, you're, you're increasing in your love for one another. In all of that, he said, guess what? You are persevering. You're not quitting. You're not retreating. You're enduring the trials and troubles, even though I know that you're tired from the battle. How many of you have ever been tired of the battle? Man, I do. I get tired of the battle all the time. I want you to recognize in verse 4 the connection between, listen, growing faith, increasing love, and perseverance. You say, how can I endure this? How can we persevere through this? And the answer is what? Growing faith, increasing love. I want you to see the connection. As we grow in our faith, we will endure life's most difficult times. As we increase in our love for one another, we will endure things that really threaten our relationship. How many of you have ever had a conflict with somebody? Right? Well, how do you persevere? How do you endure? How do you overcome that? Well, you just have to love them more. 
perseverance or endurance is the fruit of growing faith and love. So you might ask yourself, okay, why, why, why does somebody quit? Why do we bail out on God? Why do we bail out on serving God? I'll, I'll tell you why. Because somewhere along the way, we stop growing. We stop trusting God to work in a situation that we didn't like. How many of you ever been in a situation you didn't like? It wasn't fair. And because you didn't like it, because it wasn't fair, you said, I'm done, I'm out, I'm leaving. That's not what they did. They didn't go to another town. They didn't go to another church. They said, look, you know what? We're going, we're going to persevere. And here's how we're going to persevere. We're going to trust God even though people don't like us. We're going to trust God even though people don't agree with us. We're going to trust God even though there are, my, there, there are um, mobs in the streets. We're going to trust God. We're going to endure this. You, you see, church, here it is. The strength that we need to stay the course in life, the strength that you and I need to stay the course in ministry, it, it doesn't come from just getting dressed and coming to church on Sunday. It comes from a growing faith. It comes from a growing confidence in God that God is not going to abandon you, that God is with you and that God is for you, that God is at work in you. And what is God doing in you? He's purifying you. He's refining you. Because he cares more about your holiness than he does you being healthy. Now, does God care about your health? Yes, but I'm telling you, I agree with John Piper. If we would care about holiness as much as God did, woo, it would be amazing what we would see him do. Now, congregation, this has helped me at certain low points. How many of you have had a low point in your life? I mean, a real low point in your life. How many of you had a low point in your ministry? Listen, a growing faith and an increasing love for others that are not like you, that don't agree with you and don't believe like you exactly or whatever, they're just different than you. An increasing love will enable you to persevere during those times and God will be at work mightily in your life. And so here's the secret. Remember who you are. Who are we, church? We're God's family. We live under His care. We live under His protection. How many of you are grateful for that? Remember who you are. What's the secret? We're not only God's family, we are servants of Jesus. We, we march to His orders. He's our commander. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. Jesus is our master. And He gives our life meaning and purpose. Here's the secret. Renew your confidence in God. Grow in your faith. Here's the secret. Refresh your love for others. Love more and more. And then this, guess what? And then you will find God's strength to stay the course. Now notice what I didn't say. I didn't say grin and bear it. I didn't say work harder. I didn't say try harder. I didn't say live in the flesh. What did I say? Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. Grow in your confidence that God... How many of you believe that God is sovereignly in control of everything? Can I just tell you something? I, I believe that God is in so much control that even when He's exercising judgment against unbelievers, He is purifying His church as we have to go through suffering. That's what He's doing. In fact, James chapter 1, verse 2 and 4. I want you to see these verses. They pop up on the screen, yes. Look at this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you what? Face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So he's saying, listen, we, we need to have a joyful attitude toward our circumstances, even though they're very difficult. And then he says this, because they are testing of your faith, it develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be what? So that you may be mature and complete, not taking or not lacking anything. You know what Paul, you know what James is saying here? He's saying that faith and love can flourish even though our world is turned upside down. In fact, 
when are the moments where you've grown the most? The most difficult moments. He's simply saying our faith can grow during this time. Our love can flourish during this time, even though it, we have many trials and even though there's lots of persecution. In fact, James says that's the design of trials and tribulations. Holiness is the goal. And so congregation, exceptional times require exceptional measures from you and I as God's people. And I want to say to you this morning that we're in one of those times right now on a personal level, on a family level, uh, at a church level, and also as a society. But here's the deal. We can be confident that God is working amidst our trials and troubles in our lives as individuals, in our families, in our churches, in our community, in our state, and in our nation. And what is he doing? He's refining and purifying us as believers. Now, let me, let me close by saying this. Paul says to these Thessalonian believers, hey, you're growing in your faith. Hey, you're increasing in your love. You're persevering. That's a great thing. And so what happens then if you and I are not? If you and I are not growing in our faith this morning, if we're not increasing in our love for one another, if we're not enduring life trials, let me tell you, it means one of two things. One, it could mean that we're deceived and we're not really Christians. That's what it could mean. It could mean, secondly, that we're grieving the Holy Spirit by resisting the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. All of this... God is doing something to the world. No doubt he's exercising his judgment on the unbelieving world. But listen to me carefully. He is also doing something in our lives. He's also working in our lives to refine us, to make us more like himself. And here's the deal. He's simply saying, be faithful, remain faithful, and stay busy for God. Trust in him in the midst of all of this. And congregation... The world is headed toward a consummation. And we're closer toward the end than we've ever been before. But here's the deal. In this upside down world, Paul says, this is how we can live an upright life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that in the midst of this world that's so unfaithful and it's corrupt and dying that you are faithful and father even if this world falls apart around us even if everything that has been normal in our life is is shaken up and and we never get back to that normal god i pray that you would help us remember who we are that we are in you we are part of your family we're under your care we're under your protection we're under your leadership and Father, would you help us to rely on you to grow in our faith? And would you help us, Lord, to, to show greater love to one another? And God, would you help us endure, even though in many ways we're tired of the battle? And Father, bless us now as we commit ourselves to these principles. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And today, congregation, I want you to take in what I've said, but I want you just to sit while our worship team leads us in worship. I want you to hear the message of this song and then at an opportune time, David will invite you to join in and, in, in a time of commitment. But listen to this message and music as they present it to us.
trusting in the waves and winds still know his name. Stand up and sing it with me, church. So let go my soul and trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. Let's sing that again, shall we? Let go. So let go my soul and trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. The waves and winds still know. Yeah. 
church, we're going to be home, and we're not going to have to worry about it anymore. And Give the Lord a, amen, 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 amen. And all God's people said, amen. Before we leave, I just want to call your attention to the front of your bulletin. There's a number of different mission opportunities, both here, right here in our community, but also outside. And so I want to call your attention to those opportunities. Please prayerfully consider being a part and contact those people that are involved in that trip. Let's close with a word of prayer together. Lord God, we love you, and we thank you that you are with us, and we thank you that one day, Lord, all will be made right, that we can trust your justice, we can trust your judgment. And Father, even in the midst of our suffering, God, even though we're struggling in so many ways, Father, we know that we can grow, that we can become more like you. And so would you strengthen our faith? Would you increase our love? And Father, would you enable us to endure, even though we're tired at times? Lord, bless your church in this time. Use it in a powerful way. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you and you're dismissed.